Hi, welcome back to Father Offspring Interviews. Um, as we reach our, our silver anniversary episode here, episode 25, uh, we just want to say that we, we read all of your comments and your questions and your personal stories, and we love the engagement, so please keep it coming. Jumping right into our first question of the day, um, our Deke from Greece says, can one exercise different parts of their brain in a similar way to exercising muscles? How far does this analogy go? Can someone improve their decision-making skills by exercising their prefrontal cortex? Good. Great question. Um, okay. Cliche in the field used to be by the time you're three years old, you've got all your neurons, you've got all your connections, the brain is set in stone. And that turns out to be gibberish. And the brain changes throughout your whole life. And it's constantly changing neural plasticity. And people know a ton by now about the mechanisms. Uh, you got two neurons that talk to each other across a synapse. How is it that this connection can become more excitable under some circumstances? How can neurons grow new connections, new cables? How can you get new neurons born entirely in the adult brain? And we know a lot about how that works by now and how that's a mechanism for learning to go on. And one of the themes that comes through that is this notion of activity-dependent plasticity. When you use a neuron a lot, that's when it changes. That's when it shows itself to be plastic. When you use a synaptic connection a lot, jargon in the field, what was it, families that pray together, stay together, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. When neurons are first coming together, the ones who do a lot of form stable cables. So the notion is activity, exercising particular parts of the brain will make that part of the brain function differently and hopefully better. <clears throat> so the question here is, can you do it to individual parts of the brain? You can enhance your memory. Part of the brain, the hippocampus, some related structures, you enhance it every time you go and like after a lecture, you study the notes afterward. You remember it better. Or you can have a higher order version of that. You can learn to learn more efficiently and just sort of meta level stuff like that. You can enhance the function of some of your sensory systems. For example, like auditory cortex, which is processing sound. It's predominantly on the left side around here. So you get someone who spends the summer learning a musical instrument and by the end of the summer, more of their auditory cortex is devoted to processing, not music, but the sound of that musical instrument, that specialization. <coughs> so that would be an example. You've exercised that part of your auditory cortex. Then the study, I totally love this one in terms of like what volunteers are willing to do. They got a bunch of people to learn like a five note little exercise thing on a piano, and they convinced these, these martyrs to scientific progress to do this over and over and over for a couple of hours a day for weeks, months, I don't know what. And they showed afterward that their brain, their sensory motor cortex had completely remapped to being more attuned to the dexterous motor action to this. Then, just when you thought that couldn't be topped, they got some even crazier volunteers who learned the same finger exercise. And then they would spend hours every day thinking about doing it and thinking about doing it, imagining it. And by the end of that time, they had remapped that part of their motor cortex as well. So the question becomes, can you do that with your part of the brain that's got to do with decision making and making prudent ones instead of impulsive ones, which is all about the frontal cortex. Frontal cortex, greatest part of the brain. We talked about it endlessly. It makes you do the hard thing when that's the right thing to do. That's fantastic. How do you make the frontal cortex stronger at what it does? And like, in a sense, we're doing that every time we're on the diet and we're looking at the whatevers and we're trying not to have something. You're trying to figure out techniques or don't look at it. Distract yourself. Think about your coronary blood vessels blocking up whatever it is. Do the exercises needed to make your 
prefrontal cortex better at resisting this temptation so that, you know, eventually you could just be in a bathtub full of M&Ms and not indulge or anything. Um, but other versions of that as well. How do you train your prefrontal cortex to get you to do the right thing, for example, not to steal something? And what you see is there's gradations, Kohlberg stages of moral development, which is basically asking your prefrontal cortex to do something fancier and fancier. Don't steal something because you're going to get caught. To don't steal something because there's laws against it. To oh my God, if what if everyone did that? To this is just intrinsically something wrong. You're getting a stronger prefrontal cortex in each of those cases. How about decision making? How do you make your prefrontal cortex stronger in that regard? Somebody asks you, so what should be the solution to this? What do we do? And you want to have some sort of buffer against the notion of just making some impulsive decision. Here's an exercise you can do. Stop at that point just when you were about to announce your decision and go through this frontal exercise. What would be the strongest argument of somebody who disagrees with me on this? And do perspective taking with that or a more emotive version of that you were just about to form a judgment about someone in perhaps a very negative way. And hold on a second there with your now strengthened frontal cortex. Think through how'd they wind up that way? How are they looking at the world differently from me? All of that. So lots of these great techniques for making your prefrontal cortex stronger and less impulsive and more self-discipline than that. But then something totally cool happens in that after a while, you do this enough and you don't even need your prefrontal cortex. And this was this fantastic study. I may very well have cited this before because it's one of my favorites. Josh Green from Harvard. This clever experimental design where people had an opportunity to cheat repeatedly in some game and they would get a reward for it. And there was a way to detect if people cheated. And you could see it, what was going on in their prefrontal cortex when these people had the opportunity to cheat and the ones who did cheat and the prefrontal cortex activated like crazy. Should I do it? Should I not? And wrestling all of that. And then looking at the people who never, ever cheated. And were these people who had trained their prefrontal cortex so much that it could just wrestle down Satan and there overcome that temptation? Or did it have nothing to do with the prefrontal cortex by then? It had become automatic. It's not a temptation. You just don't do that. Doing the right thing isn't the harder thing because it's become automatic by then. So by the time you're trying to train your prefrontal cortex to do a better job, when you've really trained it, the greatest thing is after a while, it becomes automatic. Okay, our next question is from Aaron from Minnesota, who asks, is it true that acetaminophen can alleviate the pain of social rejection? If so, what does that say about how the brain processes different kinds of pain, emotional, physical, social, etc.? Uh, yes, and it suggests all sorts of interesting stuff. Okay, pain. How does your brain process pain. There's circuits, you stub your toe, and there's information that goes to your spine and up to your brain. And it goes to parts of your brain, somatosensory cortex, something called the periaqueductal gray, that's doing like the boring stuff. It's telling you, ooh, was that my toe or my finger? Ooh, was that a sharp pain or was that a grating, repetitive one? All that, you're just getting like the parameters of the pain. Then you get activation in addition in two parts of the brain, one called the anterior cingulate cortex and the other called the insular cortex. And that's got to do not with, was that my toe or my finger? That's got to do with what's my interpretation of that pain? What does that mean? And there's circumstances where pain can be great news. There's circumstances where if you've been faked out with a placebo, these parts of the brain don't activate, whereas the other parts know absolutely they just poked your finger with a needle, all of that. So these are the higher level interpretive parts of what pain is about. So that brings us to this initially sort of superficial thing that we've got all these linguistic metaphors about emotional pain and psychic pain. My heart broke. 
ripped my guts out to hear about that, things of that sort. And what you begin to see is, exactly as implied by this acetaminophen question, there's an overlap. The same parts of your brain that interpret the meaning of physical pain does the same about psychic pain. And this was shown, this is where it sort of pioneered somebody at UCLA, Naomi Eisenberger, who came up with one of the all-time, like, psychologically traumatic studies ever, the cyberball experiment. You sit there, and you're a volunteer, and you're looking at a computer screen, and there's three triangles, and you're this triangle, and you're told the other two triangles are two people in either room on either side, and they're in brain scanners also. They don't really exist. It's a computer program, but there's a virtual ball that you get to throw back and forth to each other and having a fine time doing that, and then suddenly oh no, they stop throwing the ball to you. They just throw it back and forth to them and they socially exclude you. Okay, what's the control on this to see how you react now to the social exclusion? You're going along, all three of you, and they say, oops, there was just some glitch with the computer. We lost contact with your room. So for a while, it's just going to be between the two of them, a computer error versus oh no, they decided I'm a dork and don't want to throw the ball to me anymore. And what do you see? Activation of pain pathways. Not, ooh, my toe is hurting, but upper level stuff. Activation of anterior cingulate, activation of the insular cortex, which has something to do with disgust. I'm disgusted by the fact that they could exclude me from this. These are... And it's about psychic pain. And what it tells you is you've got neurons up there in your anterior cingulate that cannot tell the difference literally between physical pain and psychic pain. Okay, so you see this overlap on the anatomical level. You see it on the neurochemical level also. You get somebody to spend a whole lot of time thinking about some socially painful thing that happened to them, reflecting, and you stick them in a PET scanner, and you can show the signaling of their opioid neurotransmitter pathways changes as a result. And as a result, their threshold for physical pain has changed. There's neurochemical crosstalk between them. There's genetic crosstalk. It turns out there's different genetic versions of the gene for the mu opioid receptor, and certain versions of it make people both more responsive to psychological, social ex exclusion pain and physical pain. The systems are overlapping. Okay, so you would ask, why did it turn out this way? What a bizarre thing. And what we see is some of the totally clumsy, inefficient, ass-backwards features of brain evolution, which is you come up with something new, and it's fairly recent, like empathy or emotional pain or things of that sort. Reptiles, dinosaurs, we're not very into that. Come up with something new. You can't come up with a whole new part of the brain. So you get this committee that decides, okay, anterior cingulate, it tells you what this physical pain means. How about we also now have it do what psychological pain means and what social exclusion pain means? And you just sort of jam it into its portfolio, and you get neurons that now have double duty with this, and they've got to navigate the difference between literal pain and metaphorical pain. And the thing is, they're not very good at differentiating them because it's registering the same way, and that's how psychological pain can indeed rip your guts out in terms of that's how strong of an overlap there is. So what that winds up setting us up for is this question here, what about like you take a traditional old painkiller like acetaminophen and people know how it works. They used to think that it worked peripherally. It's mostly working in the brain and some of these relevant pathways. And a number of studies now have shown that you put people on acetaminophen, not like just here, swallow these, but they take some every day for a month or so. And each day they're recording how often are they feeling a sense of social pain? How often are they feeling a sense of angst and empty. And what you see is a number of studies now showing acetaminophen reduces that type of social pain. That's very cool. A couple of qualifiers. 
doesn't work on everyone. One study showed that it is more effective in people who are prone towards forgiveness. And whoa, that takes us back a couple of episodes to why does awe bring about humility because of gratitude and forgiveness and the whole interaction with that. The other is these are totally exciting studies, but when you look closely at them, they're not gigantic effects. They're not enormous. So there's some qualifiers there. But nonetheless, whoa, painkillers can kill psychological pain. But then you get to the downside of it, something else your anterior cingular and insular cortex do that they were never doing in dinosaurs back when, which is forget feeling your own emotional pain, feeling somebody else's pain. And it turns out empathy is registering up in an anterior cingulate and insular cortex as well. And neurons there can't tell the difference between your physical pain, your psychic pain, and the pain of somebody who counts as worthy of your empathy. So now we say, uh-oh, what if you give somebody acetaminophen? What happens to their capacity to feel someone else's pain? And that gets blunted. And that appears to be a downside. What this mostly shows, again, this is just cool. They're not big effects, but nonetheless showing your brain just evolved this overlap. Pain is a very, very real thing, whether psychological, whether empathic, or whether physical. And it gets modulated by all sorts of stuff, like whose face it is, and what the circumstances for you, and if you just happened to take some acetaminophen a couple of hours ago. All right, finally, Kevin from DC says, Pinker has discussed music as being an evolutionary cheesecake of sorts. However, some ethnomusicologists and psychologists have contended that there is a socially binding quality to rhythms being shared, felt, and moved to in group settings, so the discovery and utilization of repeated rhythmic figures as a bonding mechanism was actually crucial to our development as a highly social creature. So what say you, Professor? Is music, or at least rhythm, cheesecake crucial in the middle? Well, first off, this was a great education for me because I realized for years I've been talking about how Pinker, Stephen Pinker of Harvard, has speculated whether music is cake frosting. And oh no, it's actually cheesecake. So thank you for clearing that up. Um, in terms of what's the adaptive value of music, we're suddenly back into last week's topic about dancing and adaptive value of that. And is it a way of communicating? Is it a way of mate attraction? All of that. So what about music? And I think you're honing in on sort of the really interesting component of it, which is rhythm. Rhythm, it's a universal, every culture has music, every culture has rhythm. Some of the earliest instruments out there were percussive ones. I love rhythm. I, I like rhythm much more than melody, and I probably, synesthesia, I, I like food texture more than I like food flavor. Um, but rhythm, so what do you see is there's a general picture that there are universals of rhythm across cultures. What are some of the universals? Regularly spaced intervals of beats. So that. Ones where there's a hierarchy of emphasis. What I mean, a downbeat. So all of them have hierarchies of emphases like that. They have downbeats. All of them, all rhythms are built around iterations of doublets and triplets of rhythm. And what you see is all cultures' rhythms involve repetition of these motifs and then elaborations on them. And what you then see is there's like a bunch of these small building block motifs of rhythm, and every culture out there does makes use of them in culture-specific ways. Like you get like god awful people in evening gowns at Viennese balls at waltzes of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And they're using the blindingly simplistic triplet over and over and over again. Or you can have a certain style of Latin American music that does one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, three, two, two, two. I like to be in America. Okay, by me in America. And then you can go really crazy with like Bartok Romanian folk dance stuff where it's switching between like five, four, and seven, four, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. 
Very cool. Okay, so you've got building on all of that, but it's all the same building blocks that you find across all these cultures. And this brings up one of my all-time favorite studies. This was a paper, Nature, Human Behavior, 2016 group at University of Edinburgh, where they made people, in a sense, play rhythm telephone. You know, you got one person and you give them a message and they whisper it in the next person's ear and the next person, and you see typically how it mutates and degrades. And what they saw here was something different. They would get strings of eight people, non-musicians. Musicians were booted out, strings of eight. And the first one would listen to a completely random sequence of beats. And then they would have a single drumstick and a sort of drum pad there. And they would say, yeah, imitate that, replicate that, and go and do that. And they would do that and they would record it. And then they would play that recording for the second person and say, replicate that, record it onto the third. And what they showed was this random bunch of beats and different random ones given to each set of eight or so. What you would see is over the course of the eight, it would become more regular. The intervals began to straighten out. It became more repetitive. Suddenly you had structures of doublets and triplets coming in there so that by the end you saw this convergence onto this very finite number of different rhythm motifs, which people evolved over the course of these eight iterations of cultural evolution there, they evolved converging back on one of these human universals of rhythm, which is so cool. Where there is a problem, though, is in the title of the paper, they use the word universals of rhythm stuff. And then you say, oh, no, actually, these were all students at the University of Edinburgh. Oh, that problem, a very selective population. Since then, I see there's been a number of papers that have looked at things cross-culturally. One of them looked at 15 different cultures, urban populations, indigenous, rural, all of that, and showing everybody was building rhythms in the same sort of way. So universal in that regard, not universal. People preferred the motifs of their own culture. What do you know that makes sense? So we've got this sort of deeply embedded thing there. And then it turns out that it's not just us. Like chimps will drum rhythmically under different circumstances and it shows a lot of the same characteristics. There's this whole universe of people who study bird songs and how the brain is plastic, going back to the first question, how birds new, learn new songs each season, things like that. But it turns out the structure of bird song is built around doublet and triplet syllables that are much the same. And then you look at primates who sing. There's South American monkeys who sing gibbons and siamangs, sing to their mates for life, and lemurs and Madagascar sing. And this was one study of lemur singing vocally for mate attraction, for vocalizing about predators, things. And again, very similar structures to what you see in human rhythms. Then the best example of that is with rock hyraxes. Hyraxes are these little rodent fluffy things that are actually bizarrely most closely related to elephants and sea cows. And I'm not even sure what a sea cow is, but rock hyraxes live up on rocks at high altitudes in the tropics. And there are these furry little things and they have songs they sing and an analysis is showing that, again, the same structural stuff. Okay, hooray, that's cool. And then it turns out you can see evolution's hand playing out here because the rock hyraxes who sing more rhythmically, more reproducible rhythms, have a higher reproductive success. They attract more mates. There has been selection for precisely these traits. And as like an extra special show and tell, we're going to finish here listening to who I can only assume is one of the most magnetically attractive rock hyraxes of all time. So let's listen to him. Notice we've got a rhythmic twos and threes that he has one phrase of this. And then he does the phrase a total of five times, and each time it's a little bit different. And the last time he goes completely loose, crazy improvising. So listen to this.
I think there's little more to be said on the subject. And on that melodious note, that is it for episode 25. Uh, keep submitting your questions at the forum found in the Instagram story highlight and bio or the YouTube video description. I'm Offspring Sharsapolsky, and thanks for your continued support of Science and the Beard. <laughs>